This is your brain. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. The German study suggests that the U.S. government's claim that ecstasy causes devastating, irreversible brain damage was a dramatic exaggeration. That's part of the reason I want to legalize it, too, because we can figure out, hey, look, this is safe. This is the right dosage. Now, there are people who think it's a bad idea. There are people who think smoking and, and, and drinking are bad okay, ideas. I think it's better to make them that just that. one dose could mess up your brain for life. Researchers at a Norwegian university have looked back at early medical trials of LSD and found evidence it could be used to treat alcoholism. Psilocybin decreases the amount of activity that's occurring, therefore decreasing activities associated with depression. The, uh, California state law where medical marijuana appears to be helping so many people with cancer. They take ayahuasca as a medicine. They say it's a medicine for the body and the soul. A thousand deaths related to drug we violence. We see the failure of the policy of prohibition in our society. It's the beginning of a very significant uh, scientific investigation of the actions of, of uh, psychedelics. <laughs> In the popular press, hallucinogens have been portrayed as a recreation, an escape, or a dangerous invitation for abuse. But there is another side to the story. The truth is that more people die each year from using simple pain relievers than from all illegal drugs combined. And of those caused by illegal drugs, the vast majority are caused by street narcotics such as cocaine and heroin. Almost none are due to psychedelics. This is a glass of water. It contains 100 gamma of LSD-25, one-tenth of a milligram. Let us observe the effect some three hours later. I can see everything in color. And the dimensions and all the, the prisms and the rays and everything coming down through you and, and moving. What does this all mean to you? I've never seen such infinite beauty in my life. There was great hope in the early 50s that LSD was going to revolutionize psychiatry. And in some sense, that hope was not misplaced. In the 1960s, drugs like LSD had moved out of mainstream medicine into recreational use. I think the powers to be to some extent felt that things were getting out of control so that in the mid-60s there was a move to try and put the lid back in the bottle, to get the genie back into the bottle, uh, to try and restore social control that appeared to be on the verge of breaking down. Anti-war demonstrators protest U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War in mass marches, rallies and demonstrations. If we're going to be able to prosecute wars in the future, uh, we can't have too many people taking drugs like LSD. When they would take it, they go, wait a minute, why am I supposed to go fight in Vietnam? Exactly, explain to me, what am I doing over there? You're wanting me to kill these other people, but they're just like me, I'm killing a part of me. And You do see out of the box with LSD. You do see past culturally imposed values. You know, the whole goal was to sort of crack open the mind, break away from the constraints of a culture that we felt was inhibiting the human potential, that we might embrace a new realm of possibilities. The upshot, though, was quite extraordinary in that in order to ban a drug, you had to paint it as having extreme dangers linked to it. And the biggest and most convenient danger to use was the idea that you would get hooked. In actual fact, you cannot become physically dependent or get addicted to uh, a drug like LSD. To try to deal with something like this in a straightforward scientific manner is really difficult because you're really dealing with irrational, fear-based reactions 
that have nothing to do with what the drugs have done in the past and what they can do in the future. It's been 40 years, 50 years, essentially, since all clinical work on psychedelics was shut down. Despite the restrictions on research into LSD, its dramatic effects on the brain had put scientists on the trail of a new and intriguing neurotransmitter called serotonin. Serotonin is referred to as a neurotransmitter system. It's also referred to as a neuromodulatory system because it modulates or regulates not only a lot of different kinds of processes in the brain, but it also regulates the activities of other neurotransmitter systems. Psychedelics have a, a similar kind of role in the brain, although sometimes what they're doing is uh, releasing the control that serotonin has over certain areas of the brain. So everything that's coming in through your senses, except for smell, comes in the brain and goes through an area called the thalamus, which is kind of like a gateway. The thalamus decides what gets sent to the cortex. And the cortex, these executive areas, is what, you, what puts together your whole sort of gestalt. What is your reality? Now, these two parts of the brain, the lower part of the brain that regulates the flow of information and the middle parts of the brain that provide the emotional interpretation of the information are linked through these serotonin circuits. And so one of the things that these psychedelics do is that they stimulate this serotonogic circuitry that enhances the connections between the emotional brain and this lower behavioral and informational brain. So this is why I talk about these psychedelics as really being better characterized as psychointegrators. They function much like serotonin in integrating the activities at the different levels of the brain, but they do so in a way that changes the serotonin's sort of repressive control mechanisms, regulating us from having too much information to saying, you get it all. And this is part of the overwhelming experiences that people have, but it's also why we get these uh, intense insights, uh, these you know, intuitive understandings, uh, the sense that everything is now all connected together because the brain really is being connected together by the way these substances interface with the serotonin system. What really got researchers interested in serotonin and its functions was the fact that LSD resembled serotonin chemically. Not only that, but LSD affected all of these various functions of serotonin and was really used as a molecular tool to understand what serotonin was doing. If you had a psychiatric disorder, say you were schizophrenic in the 1940s, the general consensus then was, or the belief was then, that you were schizophrenic because your mother had failed in some way. You had, you had not had a nurturing mother, she had not breastfed you. There was no concept that what happened in your behavior was in any way related to brain neurochemistry. Among these drugs, the hallucinogens, are included mescaline, a chemical taken from the peyote cactus, psilocybin, extracted from a variety of Mexican mushroom, DMT, synthesized from the compound tryptamine, and of course, LSD-25. Albert Hoffman discovered LSD in 1943. Sandoz began to send it out to psychologists and psychiatrists, say, here's something that produces a state like mental illness. You can use it to learn about it, possibly use it as a tool to study mental illness. So serotonin, which principally occurs in the gut, was isolated and uh, identified in about 1948, about five years later. LSD was, uh, you know, showed tremendous promise and continued to show promise as a tool in neuroscience, as a tool for understanding brain functions. William James, the famous American psychologist, uh, made a distinction between two different kinds of ways behavior change. And he talked about the educational variety of behavior change where things occur incrementally, we learn things, and that's how we normally think about behavior change. And then he said, you know, there's a different kind of way human behavior changes, and that's an all or none type of change. Psychologists have used various terms to describe conversion experiences or quantum change or epiphanies to kind of grab the idea that the human organism is capable of having a profound shift of perceptual awareness. 
Often in a psychedelic session, there is a sense that there is a process unfolding that's just incredibly well-crafted, incredibly wise. And it's not coming from the, the person who has ingested the substance or the guide. It's coming from uh, the depths of the unconscious itself. People recognize very often the pain that they've been running away from all their lives. But they also recognize that central and indestructible part of themselves that they've never seen before, at least that they've lost touch with. And ultimately, that entailed feeling drawn into this transcendental, mystical realm of, of the self beyond the individual historical life and beyond that to the profound unit of states that the Hindu would call samadhi or the Christian might call the beatific vision. A Sufi would call fana, the profound awareness at the very core of the mystery of what we are. I'm reminded of uh, a slogan or two I saw some students carrying once. One said, uh, all wars are civil wars because all men are brothers. Right. And another one said, there is no they. Right, exactly. And that's one of the components of the LSD experience, the understanding that there is no they, there's no other. It is all one. This member of the mushroom family, this fungus, is for the moment known only as X. It was discovered barely weeks ago growing in a remote rainforest. Science has not yet given it a name, for science knows scarcely anything about it. But it is felt that X might have one remarkable quality, that it stimulates extrasensory perception, enabling the mind to become telepathic and clairvoyant. Now, that's a rather large claim. Is it true or false? The answer to that question took us on a unique and distant journey. We suddenly found this, a way to explore a continent that we didn't know existed and not many other people knew existed either. Just like Marco Polo, you know, in the 14th century, he went with his uncle and his father to China and then came back and said stories about China. And people said, oh, you're hallucinating. <laughs> you're, you're crazy. There's no such thing. There's no such place. You know, you made that up. You're fantasizing. He said, no, you could go for yourself. So we suddenly found that there's a ship that can take you to this other continent that you didn't know existed. And there's all these amazing animals and people and trees and plants and mountains and situations going on that you never heard about before. And that, you know, are incredibly interesting that all kinds of fascinating relationship to our own selves <laughs> and give us insights into who we are in a very interesting way and in novel and productive way. So we would take psilocybin and sit around in a group and talk to each other. Now, later on, and nowadays, I wouldn't do that. I mean, that's not a good way to do it. You might sit in a group and take psilocybin, but you'd stop talking. You see, in psychedelic therapy, you put your eye shades on and listen to music and pay attention to what's coming through from within. Of course, then you do external talk in order to integrate and understand your experience and bring it back translation. That's like you come back from the undiscovered country and then you talk to other people who've also been there and say, whoa, what did you find and what did you find? And maybe some people are specialists in the plants and others in the animals and others in the people and the culture and the geography and so forth, like that. And so it's like an expedition. In the 60s, some people used mushrooms for the hallucinogenic effects. Well, now those same so-called magic mushrooms are being used to ease the pain and anxiety of cancer patients. You know, I thought that the people that would come to us would be biased. They would have been children of the 60s. They would have done hallucinogens a lot in their youth. And they would have been like groovy hippies or ex-hippies that came to us. That has not been the case of the people we've treated so far. Just sort of brave individuals who have enormous amount of distress associated with having cancer, who weren't biased in any way by these drugs. They just were looking to get out of the suffering they were in. When the individual is told that he or she 
it has a limited life expectancy, it is very common to have a, a great deal of anxiety about the anticipated uh, pain that might occur and anxiety about the unknown. What does uh, the passage to death signify? There's also often a great deal of apprehension uh, about what will happen to significant others that will be left behind. I was very skeptical at first. I was very worried about taking people who were dying of cancer and who were already anxious and about making them more anxious. I spent a lot of time looking into the safety literature and speaking to the groups at Johns Hopkins and UCLA and actually hearing some testimonies of former patients and even speaking to some former patients. And I became more and more reassured that this was safe and that if you screen patients properly, that this was potentially very beneficial. We saw a considerable indication that there was both a short-term and a sustained over time alleviation of anxiety. And here we're talking specifically about the anxiety, the existential anxiety associated with their uh, limited life expectancy. A new report in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences suggests that the key ingredient in magic mushrooms, psilocybin, may be the perfect aid for certain mental disorders. Early research has shown that psilocybin is helpful for terminally ill cancer patients dealing with anxiety and possibly people with severe forms of depression. The Good Friday Experiment was an attempt to take the tools of science to look at this question, can psychedelics, in this case psilocybin, catalyze a religious mystical experience? Because these people were divinity students at the time, most of them were ministers after all these years. And many of them reported that they had had non-drug mystical experiences in their life after the Good Friday experiment. And that gave them a point of reference to compare to their drug experience. And these people compared it in a way that it was, again, either identical or very similar to, but they determined in their view that their psilocybin experience was genuinely mystical. The experience that day demonstrated to me the reality of God's presence in all the world and in all experience. Um, if our eyes are opened and we are able to perceive and take that in. And uh, by eyes, I mean our spiritual inner uh, awarenesses. I would say, yeah, it did change my life. When they started talking about what the implications of that experience had been for their life, that's when I started understanding what to me felt like one of the keys to the 1960s, to the cultural revolution of the 60s. They felt that they were motivated to be part of the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the women's rights movement, the environmental movement. The hippies in the 60s, I mean, we had a racial bias a lot of places, but the hippies were black and white and yellow and every other color because those barriers came down in people who took psychedelics. They, those cultural barriers were gone and they could see through that. It was a transparency and they said, well, he's just like me. She's just like me. We're all part of this thing. And if they had mystical experiences, it was even more profound because they realized everything is all part. Everything is all one. When you have this unitive mystical experience, because it's unitive, you identify with people that you might normally not. So that there's a deeper part of ourselves, deeper than our country, you know, deeper than our nationality, deeper than our religion, deeper than our gender, deeper than our skin color, deeper than our sexual orientation that there's this core element that binds us together. A hallmark feature to the mystical experience is one in which there's just a sense of the interconnectedness of all people and things, a sense that all is one. And that experience is accompanied by this noetic sense that the experience at its core is more real and more true than everyday waking consciousness. Lucid dreaming is you're dreaming, but you're conscious that you are dreaming. So suddenly you're having a dream and you go, I'm having a dream. And you're aware that you're having a dream within the dream. Psychedelics have been suggested to produce an effect like that. And if you look at the electrical state of the brain in a waking normal person, and you see a lot of activity in the frontal cortex because that's where all the information is coming in to be processed. So when people take a psychedelic and have that mystical transcendent experience,
the brain is still functioning and conscious, but it's getting no data from your feeling, touch, the body. The body's gone. So now you just have this basically pure consciousness. So what happens then? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, I think it's incredibly interesting. We still don't know. Uh, and these drugs are the tools that will uh, enable us to figure it out. We've asked the question, where does it work in the brain to produce its effects? And how do the changes it produces in the brain lead to these uh, remarkable experiences, both of alterations in sensation, but also alterations in feeling and uh, emotion and the, the sense of being more at one with the universe? And what we found was completely surprising and exactly the opposite of what we predicted. Because we found that psilocybin turned off blood flow in key parts of the brain, such as the prefrontal cortex, such as the posterior cortex, and the thalamus. And when you look at those parts of the brain, you realize that they actually are the parts of the brain which control and integrate the way in which the brain processes information. They're the kind of gatekeeper regions, the nodes which regulate what you do and how you feel. And by switching those off, we kind of liberate the rest of the brain so that it can do other things. And that's why you get the expansion of consciousness. The core of what we found in our studies in healthy volunteers at Johns Hopkins is that there is this quantum change, if you will, in terms of perception of life and self and attitudes and moods and behavior. Most people are still endorsing that this experience is among the most personally meaningful and spiritually significant experiences of their entire lives. So we can now actually study the mystical experience or transcendent experience is maybe a better term for it, transpersonal experience, with pharmacological tools, using scientific tools. I think that's a huge accomplishment and a huge sort of break from the way it's always been. We're just relearning how to let it be okay to call these things real, to call these practices real again seeing that these kinds of experiences can be occasioned and that they're producing reports of long-lasting attributions of personal meaning and spiritual significance really got my attention. I was diagnosed to have terminal cancer a few months ago and naturally there's a lot of fear and anger and pain, emotional pain that surrounds something like that. It has allowed me to open up and have communication with my family that I have never been able to have before. This morning the Drug Enforcement Administration is announcing its intention to place the drug known as MDMA or by the street name Ecstasy under emergency controls in Schedule 1. There were trials where a DEA administrative law judge heard hours and hours of testimony and made the decision that Schedule 3 made the most sense. It would be a prescription medicine and there would be a lot of restrictions on it, but it would be much, much easier to do clinical research with it. But the DEA did not take its own administrative law judge's recommendation, and they went ahead and put MDMA in Schedule 1. And, you know, what's interesting is MDMA has been in Schedule 1 for 25 years now, and it's, you know, just as easy to get as it's ever been, if not more. I mean, it's become a very popular drug of abuse. Millions of people around the world are taking this drug recreationally. I mean, one thing that you see is that when you're taking sort of a known quantity of a known substance in a medical setting or a therapeutic setting, it's very safe. Because this drug is illegal, when somebody buys ecstasy, they may be getting MDMA or they could be getting any number of chemicals that are not bad for you or horribly bad for you. Because of prohibition, the issue of drug substitution and counterfeit pills and things like that is very much an issue. That's one of the problems with um, the way drugs are approached in this society. Kids don't learn about using these things in a safe and wise way. When MDMA first came into public awareness, the government officials were calling it another hallucinogenic amphetamine. And I knew a lot about what the structures of hallucinogenic amphetamines look like. And I thought, that doesn't make sense that that's a hallucinogen. My laboratory actually published the first 
biochemical work on MDMA in 1982 before anyone even called it ecstasy or knew what it was. We showed that it released serotonin. Amphetamines themselves, amphetamine or methamphetamine, release principally a dopamine, a transmitter called dopamine, and also norepinephrine, but also release a certain amount of serotonin. MDMA has mostly its effect on serotonin. It releases serotonin, but also releases norepinephrine and also releases dopamine. So in some respects, it's working like methamphetamine, but the profile is somewhat reversed. MDMA is not a hallucinogen. It really is unique in psychiatry. There's no other drug like it. Because it is this uh, massive serotonin agonist, it basically floods the synapse or floods the brain with serotonin. It's almost like an immediate acting antidepressant or an immediate acting um, anti-anxiety medicine. They're called anxiolytics. Something that decreases anxiety is an anxiolytic. And in psychiatry, all the anxiolytics are sedating. So there is no immediate acting, non-sedating anxiolytic in psychiatry, but MDMA is an immediate acting, non-sedating anxiolytic. 30, 45 minutes after somebody takes MDMA, most people become very relaxed and happy and content. They're also awake, alert, completely conscious, cognizant of everything that's going on. They have enhanced memory for the experience, and there's also enhanced memory for early repressed traumas. So it's particularly well suited to psychotherapy, to being a catalyst for psychotherapy. We see it right now for post-traumatic stress disorder, for veterans coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq. There's a great need for treatments that the current medications, the current psychotherapies, only work partially and only work in certain subjects. So the need is growing for the psychedelic medicines. One of the problems with treating PTSD is that people either have too much anxiety or too much emotional numbing in order to be able to revisit the trauma in a therapeutic way. And what MDMA seems to do is to allow people to face their fears without being overwhelmed, but yet have an emotional connection. We just recently completed what's called a phase two clinical trial of MDMA-assisted therapy, psychotherapy for treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress disorder. We would encourage them to spend a good bit of the time focusing inward without talking. And we had headphones with a program of music and eye shades. We had an agreement with everyone that if there, nothing about their trauma came up, then we could bring it up, but we never had to do that. It always came up spontaneously, but not necessarily right away. We encourage people to be open to the idea that kind of their own inner healing intelligence would bring whatever experience needed to come. It seems that MDMA helps people stay in that what's called an optimal arousal zone. So one other unique thing about MDMA is that it induces in most people um, a sort of a heart opening and a sense of connectedness and empathy with other people. That may be because it, uh, it enhances uh, oxytocin release in the brain, a hormone that is involved with bonding. So I suppose um, in a world where more people were undergoing MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, you would have more people who were happy and relaxed and more trusting of other people and more caring and more empathic. My take on it in general is that it uh, somehow allows access to an experience that is a kind of fundamental inherent capacity that people have. People seem to have more empathy for others and for themselves. But it seems as if it removes the obstacles to accessing that sense of empathy. In the old time, you could go for 10 years for meditation, and then once, if you were lucky on the way, you would realize, ah, oh, that's what Jesus or Buddha meant. Now you can do it in six hours in ecstasy. It will not keep, but you get the insight. And if then you are serious, you can start to work with that insight. But first, the door has to open. It would not be the best use of it if people get the idea that the only way you can feel better is to take the drug again. I think that gets into a pattern that's, that's not useful. Psychedelic is a beautiful help to open the door as long you are ready to accept it is not the solution. It's an interesting compound and we need to know more about it. We need to understand the risks and benefits. And the only way you're really gonna understand it is to do clinical research.
Marijuana, the dried leaves and flowers of the Indian hempweed, is used in the form of a cigarette. Marijuana smoking, experts point out, can make a helpless addict of its victim within weeks, causing physical and moral ruin and death. Should you ever be confronted with the temptation of taking that first puff of a marijuana cigarette, don't do it. One of the most remarkable aspects about cannabis is that the plant itself contains hundreds and hundreds of different compounds, many of which are likely to have therapeutic value. Now, mostly we focus on THC, which is, of course, the component of cannabis that makes you stoned. But there's another very important component called cannabidiol. But cannabidiol itself is also a relaxant drug. It's recently been shown to reduce anxiety. It may also promote sleep. Early man began to use psychoactive potions. In the cave paintings, you can see the signs of an altered state of consciousness. Initially, of course, agent people didn't have any understanding of uh, things like THC, chemical molecules, these types of things, or effects on the brain. And the effects of plants like cannabis, opium, uh, coca, mushrooms, cacti, were all generally seen as magical effects that came to them through the gods. So cannabis has a very broad range of actions, and it, it's been around for 4,000 years, so it's not surprising that it's actually, its utility has been widely experienced and widely tested. It was very popular with Queen Victoria of the, in England in the 1800s. She used it to treat period pains. She used it to treat the pain of childbirth. And in fact, it was a legal medicine in Britain until 1971. And then when young people started using it, it was banned. I certainly think uh, we have made mistakes uh, in uh, penalizing people for medicinal use. We saw some cases uh, that were absolutely ludicrous. Uh, people were raising it for those purposes who've been directed to use it. So I think we should open up this whole can of worms. And I would hope that the Justice Department could work with this committee and work with members of Congress and other advocates as to how better to assess the use of marijuana. Can they come up with even one positive thing as a result of prohibition of marijuana? And if they start saying, oh, it's to keep the drugs away from our children, they're wrong. It's easier for our young people to get marijuana than alcohol. If they're going to say, well, we're going to reduce violence, we're going to perpetuate the rule of law, they're wrong. It's doing the absolute opposite. Sixty percent of all of the drug cartel's profits in Mexico come from the sale of marijuana with all of the drug-related violence that goes down there. It isn't the drugs that are causing the harm, it's the drug money. And the federal government officials say this all the time. That there's no study showing that marijuana is an effective medicine. And you know something? They're right. However, it's beyond hypocrisy for them because it's the federal government that controls the marijuana and numbers of reputable groups, the Centers for Disease Control, the University of California and others, have requested to conduct the studies and they've been deprived of that authorization. So there's no research because the government hasn't allowed the research? The government affirmatively does not allow this research to take place and then they sanctimoniously say, well, there's no research that shows it. It's beyond hypocrisy. I view it as chutzpah. Cannabis is less harmful to the health than alcohol or tobacco. And therefore, it is completely out of order that it should be in this high prohibited category. Tobacco, to the best of my knowledge, is the only substance that we sell in the United States that when used as directed, causes death. Right, absolutely. Shouldn't we, shouldn't we be incorporating tobacco into our drug policies? No, certainly, certainly. And, and that argues more and more for it being a, a public health issue rather than a criminal right. issue. I think the ultimate threat of these substances when it comes to modern society is their ability to break consensus trance and throw people into looking at things in a novel new way. Society went through a massive upheaval. There was a sexual revolution. People started protesting wars. And the government themselves directly sought a relation between this and drug use, particularly cannabis use.
we must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one in the United States, the problem of dangerous drugs. Drugs are menacing our society. They're threatening our values and undercutting our institutions. Ronald Reagan, for instance, and his son Ronald Reagan Jr. in an interview uh, when questioned about his uh, mother Nancy's Just Say No campaign and his father's uh, support for the war on drugs said in relation to marijuana, it's not marijuana the mildly mind-altering substance, it's marijuana the antithesis of the state. At the time I had no reason to believe that there was anything sinister going on. This estate looks like a nice place to raise a family, but this seemingly safe suburb was hiding a dangerous secret. Police finding five cannabis grow houses on two neighbouring streets. I'm a bit, bit scared. Chelsea and her family live in the area, but are now moving out solely because of the drug raid. Well, I've got rental agreements. I'm going to find another place to live. Yeah, cannabis has had a rough time over the last century or so. And one of the real problems I think we have now is that medicinal cannabis is only available in some countries, still not available in the United Kingdom, and that's a serious loss and, and it's a detriment to many of our patients. We've done research on the different constituents of cannabis. THC, which gets you high, CBD, which is an amazing compound which is antipsychotic, anti-anxiolytic, anti-diabetic. It's a very good compound. It's been grown out of the crop because the crop has been modified and grown so that it has as high THC as possible. It's, it's a tragedy that our youth can only get that type of cannabis, more or less. Uh, there's a lot to be learned about that, and I think um, it can be a real problem for kids using it in a way that um, doesn't have that kind of set and setting. There's a lot of learned knowledge which can more easily be passed on in a regulated system. Well, on one hand, we decry the scourge of drug abuse. On the other hand, we say that, you know, you should take drugs instead of dealing with a behavioral problem, instead of implementing novel things such as parenting. Kids are a behavioral problem so they can be medicated so that they're no longer a problem. As a result, we have a whole generation that is grown up to rely on drugs. And so then they find out that the drugs that are prohibited actually work much better than the pharmaceutical drugs. They're often more effective. And so they can see no reason um, not to use those, those substances. While autism is not a qualifying medical condition like cancer or severe pain, in Alex's case, the seizures are. His parents give him a liquid form of the drug, and after a few months of treatment, the Eccles say they saw a dramatic improvement. He went from hitting himself, blooding his face. Within an hour, hour and a half, he would be playing with toys, using his hands, something that at that time was almost unheard of. They're not advocating the use of medical marijuana for all autistic children but they say walk a mile in their shoes and the treatment might not seem so extreme. Seniors are the fastest growing group taking up pot. A warning, this report does contain drug references. I don't believe in drugs, but then I've also never been someone who suffered from pain. Marijuana kept me alive. I've talked to so many people, elders, who said, I never thought I would do anything illegal in my entire life. I'm a little old lady who's followed every rule I've ever heard of. But when my husband was suffering from chemotherapy, I found myself hunting for marijuana. And I had to go across that line to find it. It made me realize that not all the rules are here to protect us and that sometimes we have to look beyond those boundaries to find what we're actually entitled to have. And CNN's chief medical correspondent, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, joins me. Now, Sanjay, welcome to you. Thank you. Thanks for having so, me. So, come on, you've been looking at this for a year, and I want to remind you that in nine, uh, 2009, you wrote a Time magazine article entitled Why I Would Vote No on Pot. You've changed your mind. If, if you look at all the papers that are written in the United States about marijuana, the vast majority of them are about the harm that we fund studies on harm, we don't fund studies on benefit nearly as much. So it gives a distorted picture. But you know, I didn't look far enough, I didn't look deep enough, I didn't look at labs in other countries that are doing some incredible research, I didn't listen to the chorus of patients who said, not only does marijuana work for me, 
it's the only thing that works for me. I took the DEA at their word when they said it's a Schedule One substance and has no medical applications. There was no scientific basis for them to say that. The science is there. This isn't anecdotal. This isn't the realm, in the realm of conjecture anymore. I mean, for a long time, we've just ignored these papers, but this was a drug, you know, that was used for thousands of years. Ayahuasca and yahe are Indian words for Banisteria coffee. The literal meaning of ayahuasca is vine of the soul. This powerful hallucinogen has been credited with the ability to transport human beings to realms of consciousness where telepathy and clairvoyance are commonplace. The ayahuasca ritual is about to begin. What I was into was looking at how Amazonian Indians think about their resources and use them to be able to argue against the World Bank and other international development agencies that were enacting these big deforestation uh, projects that would take land away from people. This was about human rights and ecological destruction and trying to make the world a better place. Gracias a la tierra que nos permitió sentar y que este mensaje llegue hasta los confines de la tierra. So I had a vested interest in showing that these people were rational, but the problem was when asked, they said that their knowledge about the plants came from the hallucinations of their shamans. Um, mm, hmm, well, um, after circling around this question of the origin of their knowledge, finally one guy said, Brother Jeremy, if you want to know the answer to that question, you have to drink ayahuasca. He said it's a television of the forest and you can see images and learn things. So, um, you know, I decided to check it out. Pasteur tried it and all the great scientists, they try it on themselves. That's one of the beautiful things about science. It's not such a radical proposition to see plants as, as being teachers. In fact, it's only the alienation of Western science from our roots that creates that apparent split. I mean, uh, for thousands of years around the world, medicine was based on plants. These psychoactive chemicals in some way are a co-evolutionary mechanism, a way that, you know, and here's where we get away from science and into speculation, but a co-evolutionary mechanism by which the community of, of species, or at least the community of sentient species, has evolved to talk to this primate, if you want to put it that way, a way to share the gnosis, to share the knowledge. A famous botanist once said, plants have substituted biosynthesis for behavior. Animals interact with their environment and deal with their environment primarily through behavior. You know, the flight or fight reaction, all of this stuff. We move around. If we're threatened, you know, we get up and run away. Plants can't do that. They're stuck in one place. So they mediate their relationships with the environment through chemistry. That's why they're such great chemists. And if you are an animist, a person who sees the spirit of plants at work with agency, meaning the ability to choose to interact with another species. Suddenly the whole relationship becomes much more complicated because now they can be used as a agent essentially to form a symbiosis with this hypertrophy brain primate. And so suddenly the whole evolutionary relationship, the co-evolutionary equation has changed. The plant has an incentive to form a relationship with human beings. I think it's very significant that we talk about the shaman's experiences as an out-of-body experience. That the experiential self, what we may call the soul or the spirit or just our cognitive point of reference, becomes detached from the body. And so now we have the capability to look at the world in a way that is more than just the body-based limitations that we originally evolved to use to understand the physical world.
there is a sense in which in your mind you rise above yourself or outside of yourself and you you can see you see films about yourself once you drink you see and once you see then you can't unsee just like they say you can take this stuff and it shows you these spectacular images that teach you things there's a wisdom in the psyche that becomes more and more apparent of just what a particular person most needs to experience in order to mature psychologically and spiritually. It is often like, that is just what I needed to know, perhaps not what I wanted to know, but just what I needed to know at that moment. Nuestra identidad como nativos es que somos hijos de plantas sagradas que venimos trabajando en favor de la humanidad. De que todos somos uno. Those cultures where ayahuasca is part of the culture, no one uses it frivolously. The, the kids don't go off and party with it. It's used in a very respectful way with elders, shamans, people that know how to use it, guiding and having a safe set and setting. The mindset of the subject and the therapist and the setting in which it occurs makes a huge difference. So I think that's very, very hopeful because you're seeing a sort of a migration together again of shamanism, which has always uh, essentially been a form of psychotherapy in which the use of these substances is an integral part. And now that's coming together with clinical psychiatry and clinical neuroscience. So I think that's very encouraging because it forces us to acknowledge that mind and spirit and soul are all part of this equation. It's true that ayahuasca has become uh, surprisingly popular in uh, let's say the Western world. What's surprising about it is it's not necessarily an enjoyable experience. It's a purge. It can make you vomit and so on. I mean, you know, it's, it's not exactly a, a party drug. I must say, you wouldn't drink ayahuasca out of ceremony. It's not anything that you do lightly. And you want to be doing it with people who have been there before, who are helping you and who know what they're doing. But I remember after one of these sessions, kind of innocently saying to the men who I'd been up all night with, I said, my God, this stuff is really incredible. I mean, it just seems to, you know, it's terrifying. I mean, some of the visions just, you know, and don't you guys get scared? And they just said, you know, yeah, you know, it scares the heck out of us. The idea is to sort of rip through the placenta of ordinary consciousness to achieve some kind of illumination. But nobody said the journey was supposed to be pleasant. It's nothing I particularly either look forward to or enjoy very much when it happens. But after it happens, there's a kind of clarity and a lightness that's powerful because what's being purged actually is psychic contents that you've been holding on to you're purging anger you're purging pain you're purging some false story about the self what faster way if you're a westerner to sort of find an antidote to uh, shopping materialism and lack of meaning by having this experience what we have witnessed here is the survival of a tradition almost as old as man himself. What we had done, Lieutenant, was to establish definitely, for the first time, through careful experiments, that man at present is using only a fraction of his brain capacity, especially in the field of awareness, and that certain drugs are powerful devices for expanding this awareness toward its real possibilities. Brother and sister, together we'll make it through.
to feel good. The successfully marketed serotonin antidepressants which came into consumer use in the 1980s were sold as mechanical fix-its. In the marketer's dream, the complex system of self and environment was distilled into a pill to be cheerfully swallowed on a daily basis, offering the promise that you would return to the persona of a productive and contented citizen. This idea that we can somehow medicate ourselves into a state of happiness. This encourages drug dependence and it encourages people to not really examine the foundations of the problem that make them feel bad in the first place because you can simply mask the symptoms. It's not like any individual is wrong to do that. It's the picture that's wrong. The individuals are suffering, clearly. You know, we have to have compassion for people looking for solutions to their personal problems in whatever way they can. But it doesn't seem that medicines that dampen your desires and dampen your identity and dampen your caring about this world are are good medicines for the individual or for the planet. Overburdened by their HMO schedules, doctors no longer have the time to work through serious issues with their patients. Their only recourse is to issue a quick prescription. That's one of the problems why it's difficult to for uh, drugs like LSD or the psych other psychedelics to be integrated into the medical model. It's an experience. A therapist has to actually sit down with the person and talk with them. Depression and other types of mental illnesses are understood to be uh, chemical imbalances in the brain. It's very rare that when an SSRI is prescribed that actually measurements are taken to establish that there are chemical imbalances. I don't think that chemistry explains depression. So the idea that depression can be uh, related simply to some biochemical changes, is, I think it's a very inadequate uh, theory. Beneath depression are basically traumatic experiences. From our perspective, that's a symptom that uh, we have seen most uh, frequently changed very profoundly. We have seen people uh, coming out of uh, deep depression lasting several years, sometimes after one session. The companies are not interested to hear about a treatment that may need just to be given once or twice that could make a huge difference to people. As far as the, the dominating culture, the pharmaceutical, industrial, government complex, it's not that they don't want you to be on drugs. They want you to be on drugs. They just want you to be on corporate drugs. But what about the pharmaceutical companies? Couldn't they make a lot of money by turning all these substances into pharmaceutical products? All of these drugs are off patent. MDMA patented in 1914, it's in the public domain. LSD first synthesized in 38, it's in the public domain. Psilocybin was first synthesized in the 50s, it's in the public domain. Marijuana as a plant, these things are in the public domain. The corporate government approach is, if we can't patent it, let's prohibit it. All you do by banning these things preemptively is you create a black market, you create an opportunity for somebody to get very rich by dealing in you know, what is now a prohibited substance, and you motivate intrepid psychonauts to experiment even more. There are many people who are using substances, all kinds of different substances, legal and illegal. Just give me something, let's, let's just forget what, who I am and what's going on. And, and medicine is the opposite. Let's explore who I am and let's understand it. Psychedelics open up the door to our inner psyche. So we have human experiences under the influence of a psychedelic rather than a psychedelic experience that's somehow or other intrinsic to the drug. A flood of findings with drug addicts and convicted felons showed that these substances could recondition behavior enabling them to make dramatic changes in their lives. After participating in one of these experiments himself, Alcoholics Anonymous founder Bill Wilson became convinced that LSD could cure chronic alcoholism. In a series of studies conducted between 1954 and 1960, Dr. Humphrey Osmond proved him right. Treating 2,000 alcoholics with LSD under carefully controlled conditions and achieving a success rate that had never been duplicated by any other means. We've turned the corner on drug addiction in the United States. 
drug addiction in the United States is under control. First of all, the word addiction itself comes from the Latin word addictus. And addictus was somebody who owed somebody money, couldn't pay it back, and had to become a slave to them. So addiction always implies slavery. That, of course, includes drugs, but also includes shopping, sextaholism, addiction to power, addiction to wealth, addiction to violence, addiction to work. Anything that we try and use to fill the internal void can become addictive. On top of that, of course, we live in a society that values externals. Everybody gets the message that they're not adequate because those perceptions of not being adequate is what drive a lot of consumerism. So this society automatically and unconsciously generates insecurity in almost everybody, which of course is an alienation from the self, which of course is a source of internal distress and pain, which again leads to addictive behaviors. The serotonergic hallucinogens in particular, they're classified as drugs of addiction, but they don't induce addictive syndromes in any way that we can measure them, either in animal models or in human models. And in fact, in a way, they're misclassified um, as having high addictive potential. And the reality is, when used under the right kind of constructs, they can actually be used to treat addictive spectrum disorders. These drugs are illegal, and one remembers Professor David Nutt. I mean, it, it got so many headlines at the time. He was sacked by the, the former Home Secretary uh, for his advice, saying that ecstasy and LSD were less harmful than alcohol. Should perhaps people view this in the context that there is someone, perhaps, who just generally wants less regulation of some of these drugs? Well, this is a very specific application of the drugs. It's a medical application and these are preliminary results. And so we're interested in the potential of the drug. So really, it doesn't directly implicate the policy issues. Uh, we're more interested in being able to research these drugs for their potential benefits. No theory of neuroscience, no theory of the brain and how the brain is related to consciousness will ever be complete if it doesn't take these phenomena into account. I went to London a couple of years ago where there was some psychiatrists really trying to open up just even looking at what the old research with LSD has shown, what the old and current research on MDMA has shown, and they're just trying at that level. No one's doing any research, they're just trying to reintroduce the fact that these drugs were used, had great therapeutic results, and for some reason, the whole thing was shut down and squashed. For various complicated and misplaced reasons, these substances which historically have always been totally sacred at the center of the cultural evolution of man. They've been shoved in the bag of illegality. The powers that be have held that these things should not be allowed. They're still illegal generally, not all of them, but many of them. They're, they're held outside, not in other countries necessarily, not in every country. The countries where their traditions know that part of their innate character of their people and their relationship to the land comes through these medicines. Why would they make them illegal? They would, they would tear the people away from their own history, from their own land, from their own sense of nature, from their own health. Our decisions that our governments make about the applicability of these substances for the treatment of very important medical problems are not based upon scientific evidence. They're based upon a prohibitionist attitude that says these are dangerous drugs without any medical uses whatsoever, in spite of the fact that we have evidence that these substances have been used for medical purposes for tens of thousands of years. But because of government regulations, we're denying major aspects of our population access to medicines that they dearly need. One day, if these drugs are rescheduled, of course, it would have to be used in carefully controlled settings by trained and skilled people who had undergone, let's say, psychedelic psychotherapy training programs, and there had to be oversight and regulation. If it becomes approved for medical use, that's going to involve a societal change in the medical profession, learning how to use these properly. 
The future of psychedelics on the immediate front is getting them accepted into clinical use, maybe establishing centers or training clinicians who can use them in psychotherapy and having places where people can go and have these experiences, whether they have specific mental or physical problems or whether they just want to go for spiritual exploration of consciousness. And it's possible and I think it'd be very interesting to use them not just for disease states but to enhance human growth, spiritual growth and being more empathic and connected and perhaps better human beings. If we look at our world we are intellectually, technologically vastly overdeveloped with very primitive emotions and that's why the world is at risk. That seems to be the message that one gets from psychedelics is, you know, wake up. We're potentially the salvation of the planet and also potentially the destruction of the planet. And it may be that messenger molecules are a way to try to initiate this dialogue. Well, I think the people who would benefit most of all are professors. Uh, this, uh, I think it would be extremely good for almost anybody with uh, fixed ideas and with, uh, with a great certainty about what's what and to realize that the world he has constructed is by no means the only world, that there are these extraordinary other types of universe which we may inhabit and which we should be very grateful for inhabiting, I think. Psychedelics, they help people become aware of the multidimensional nature of the universe and of themselves. We're talking about transformation at every level, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. This rediscovery of the scientific study of, of psychedelics is opening the door to the study of many aspects of spirit. And I think science will be much richer for it. In order to use these medicines, you have to be rebel enough against a taboo to look at the taboo. And the whole nature of a taboo is that it's an area of culture where we're told, don't look there, it's not good to even look there. We have no real clear idea of all the different people that have been influenced by psychedelics. Kerry Mullis, who invented the polymerase chain reaction for which he won the Nobel Prize. Steve Jobs has written in his autobiography about how LSD was one of the most important experiences of his life. Psychedelics have catalyzed in many people a creative process that has led them to make major profound discoveries that have changed the face of the world. There always seems to be one ingredient in the recipe of social change that our generation has tried to expunge from the record, and that's the fact that millions of us lay prostrate before the gates of awe, having taken some psychedelic substance. The critics would always say, don't take these drugs because they're going to change your life forever. What they didn't understand is that was the entire point. I think it's unwise to be so scared of the possible risks of these drugs, which there are possible risks. There's risks in anything. I mean, there's risks in driving a car, there's risks in crossing a street. But to be so scared of them as to make them illegal and accessible to anyone and not even want to research them or not even want to think about them, why would we do that? Are we so sure that we can solve all the problems that confront us, that we want to throw away a possible tool that can expand consciousness, that could possibly, you know, give us some more insights and some more possibilities? of how to resolve the difficulties that we're facing? I think not. We had this conflict in the 60s when psychedelics went wrong. What I think is even deeper is when psychedelics go right, not only would these drugs have the potential to be useful in psychotherapy, they had the potential to be useful in the evolution of the human species and that they could make a major contribution to the survival of the planet. Eternity in an hour. It's almost impossible, of course, as all the patients say to describe it. There are the colors and the beauties, the designs, the beautiful way things appear. People themselves, dull people, but I thought dull, appear fascinating, interesting, mysterious, wonderful. But that's only the beginning. Suddenly you notice that there aren't these separations that we're not on a separate island shouting across to somebody else and trying to hear what they're saying and misunderstanding them. This thing's flowing underneath. We're parts of a single continent. 
it meets underneath the water. And with that goes such delight, the sober certainty of waking bliss.